Denise Horland, thank you very much for joining us today uh, to talk about uh, your uh, candidacy for re-election to the Plantation City Council. We extended the same invitation to your opponent. Uh, and he did not uh, avail himself. I'll just begin with this open-ended question, Denise. So what do you hope to accomplish uh, in a second term that, that's, that's on your agenda, that's on your plate here in Plantation? Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you, Steve and uh, Dan, for having me today. Uh, you know, I, I feel that we we were interrupted. Um, I've only served one term and we we're interrupted by COVID. And I think everything came to stop for a while. Um, there are some things that I had wanted to achieve in the uh, last four years that I'm hoping to achieve in the next four, should I be fortunate enough to be reelected. Re one of those has to do with our schools. Um, I've long wanted to put together a comprehensive school guide that we could have on the city's website so people can look on there to see what's available. Because I think um, oftentimes people will take to social media, criticize our public schools without ever setting foot on those, in those buildings. And I think there's a lot of wonderful offerings. And we know our education, especially our public school educators are really being beaten up and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So that's one of the things that I'm hoping to continue to do that work and get that out there. The other thing that I'm really pushing for, and we have a budget hearing this evening, is strategic planning. Uh, the city really does not do com comprehensive uh, strategic planning. I've gotten a commitment from administration that we will do that uh, in, and we'll commence that in 2023. Um, my, my biggest um, push for that is we really need to survey our residents and survey our business community and see what their needs are and what their desires are and create a vision for the city. Plantation's gonna be 70 years old next year. We're dealing with aging infrastructure. We're, we're dealing with uh, housing affordability, resiliency, sustainability. So those are not my two big uh, pushes for next uh, for the next term. Okay. You know, one of the things that's, um, and you're right, founded in 1953, so the city turned 70 mm -hmm. next year. That, that still makes Plantation younger than a lot of its residents, <laughs> I would think. Any, anyway, uh, uh, one of the things that has set Plantation apart was a sense of order and planning and aesthetics that you don't see in some of those other Western Broward communities. Um, why hasn't comprehensive or long-term planning, a master plan, if you will, why, why hasn't that been more of a priority? You know, I, I don't know. I think um, for many years, as you said, we had, um, uh, there was a sense of continuity. Uh, we've had long time um, administrators and mayors, um, Mayor Frank Vel Veltry was there for a couple of decades. Uh, I think that for the size of the city at that time, um, we did have a plan, but now we're faced with this uh, this growth in Broward County. A lot of people are moving down here. We're faced with, um, you know, a, a diverse population. Uh, we are at the point where we're almost at build out. So now it's about redevelopment. How are we going to deal with that? So while there may be a strategic plan in place, for the last four years, it has not included the council. Um, I, I look to other cities and see what their best practices are. I think Coral Springs is one that's done a very good job where um, city manager has brought together the council and the um, department heads, and they've really had like a day and a half where they could just hash out ideas and see what the vision is and what the priorities are. So that's, um, as I said, that's been my big push, um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to implement that with a new uh, council in 2023. Are you a proponent of the existing strong mayor system of government in your city? You know, we just had a vigorous debate about that, Steve. We are putting our city charter on the ballot for the first time in November. Um, and I, I'm one, I, for many years, I thought that it, it served plantation well. Uh, once you're sitting in that seat, you tend to look at things a little differently and you realize that elections are, are essentially popularity contests. And I think it's a it's a huge responsibility when we are a city of almost 96,000 with um, 1,000 employees that anybody could win that seat. And now they're the strong mayor and it's a lot of power and a lot of control. Um, so I was in favor of um, considering a city manager position, but I also know that there are, you know, and there are cities all around us where that has not, um, you know, bode, uh, bode well for the city. So um, I was in favor of changing it. 
Okay. Um, and, and what's on the ballot in November? Is it the entire charter or just a certain provision? The entire provision? charter. And it's really, it's not a lot of changes, Steve, but basically what it is is really streamlined. Um, what we found was the charter was just too wordy. It had not been really touched. There were a lot of um, ordinances that were amending the charter. So it's really a cleaned up version. Uh, before I was elected, we had had a charter advisory board, a consultant was brought in. And again, one of those things that was delayed due to COVID, um, I really felt it was important that the public be a part of our discussion. So we had postponed it and um, I'm thrilled that we're able to get it on the ballot this year. As you said in your questionnaire, you've been a resident of that city for almost 30 years, right? Yes, okay. 29 this month. Okay, uh, tell us just, in your own life experience, you and your family, what's been the change, good or bad, in your quality of life as a resident of Plantation? I'm asking about traffic, noise, mm -hmm. infrastructure, all that stuff. Um, I think I, I want to talk about the, the positives first. Um, I, I really think in the last several years, we've seen an expansion of, we have 42 wonderful parks in this city. Uh, I think we've seen an expansion of the programming and what we're offering the community. Parks and Recreation Department's doing a great job of getting, at, getting that information out to the residents. I think our police department, which is highly rated and um, very professional, but now we're, they're starting to really push that community engagement. We just participated in our first national night out. We have our own police rock day on the fuzz. And it's a wonderful way for them to get out there and engage the community. So I think those are all positives. I think, you know, you hit it. The negatives are the growth and we can't stop. We can't stop the growth. We can't stop the people moving to Broward County. It's about how we're going to manage that. Um, we have partnered with the Metropolitan Planning Organization this year to really look at the mobility within the city. Uh, we are waiting um, a, a PD&E plan on a proposed bridge to alleviate some of the traffic off of University and Pine Island Road. So there have been some movement in that. And, you know, I know th the current mayor often says we can't stop the traffic, but we could try to manage it. So I think that's those are the biggest changes. And I think it's just how are we going to manage that growth? And then my concern is the infrastructure. I think that if you look at our city, it's a beautiful city. We are a tree city. But there are parts that are starting to look a little worn down. So I think it's uh, the challenge is making sure that we have enough code enforcement officers out there to ensure that people are maintaining their property. Um, and I've been beating the drum for the last three and a half years on short term rentals. For me, I, that's one of the biggest negatives that our community is dealing with and everyone in the state is dealing with. Yeah, we recently published a letter to the editor from one of your constituents, a woman who said that um, that the, her complaint, her specific complaint was that the city is not enforcing the rules that it has. Right. Uh, and so I want to, how much merit is there to that criticism and, and, and tell us about what more the city should be, should and could be doing on vacation rentals. Correct. And that was actually, that email did come to me and I responded and that actually was a gentleman uh, with a first name that could have been a male or a female. He That's did not right. respond back to me. What I did say to him was, you're correct. We have an ordinance in place. Uh, this is what I've been trying to do, especially in advocating before the state legislature in the last three, three and a half years. We beat back um, a bunch of bad bills that would have further preempted us um, and tied our hands. Um, and I told him some of the things that I'm looking to do. Uh, I've asked administration and the police department to ensure that we are not just giving warnings when you have a party house with 100 cars outside that we're ticketing and towing, towing and doing anything we can under the law, because that will then get back to that owner and they will, you know, go ahead and enforce the rules uh, with the people that are renting the home. So um, I think it was a valid, a valid concern. I want to bring up an issue that you were uh, quite vocal on at the time that doesn't concern your race per se, but it's it's relevant. It certainly is relevant in the race for mayor. But um, uh, we've, we've looked at the videotape of the council meeting from 2019 where you raised the question of how did Mayor Stoner increase her car allowance without council approval, correct? Correct. Um, and so what's 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 relevant about that? Why is that important? Why is that something voters should be aware of? Um, let me tell you about how that happened, Steve. I was in the job three weeks. We had been sworn in and it was December and I was meeting with our HR director about pensions. 
and she received an email uh, on her computer at the time from the mayor who was on vacation. Um, and it was a rather threatening email. Um, and uh, in, in her wisdom at the time, and she has since passed away, um, she elucidated what was going on and said that the mayor had come to them, uh, she and the current the CAO at that time, and wanted an increase in her car allowance. And they said, we can't do that. You have to go before council. Uh, the mayor insisted that it be done, and the HR director reached out to the CAO at the time, Horace McHugh, and um, there's an email attesting to that, and he basically said to the mayor, we cannot do this, you have to go through council. Um, the email that the HR director received at that time stated, um, you work for me, you do not work for him, we'll deal with this basically when I get back in town on Monday. Subsequently, that Tuesday, um, the HR director was let out by the police chief. Um, and was terminated. Now, um, that in itself ended up costing the city um, uh, a pretty penny uh, because she did file a grievance. Um, you know, it, it was alarming to me because I was three weeks into the job. I called our city attorney and said, what do I do? And he said, at first, you need to protect yourself with the knowledge, but you also need to find out what's going on. So I did my due diligence. I found out that, yes, indeed, the mayor had increased the car allowance and made it retroactive retroactive to her uh, swearing in. And I brought it fo forward to the council during our budget hearing. And at first the mayor um, had lied to the council and said it had not taken place. Um, the decision was made after much discussion with the council uh, to have the mayor pay back the money in the form of donations uh, to various organizations in the city. But for me, why was it alarming? It was alarming to me because it was lack of transparency. Uh, and for and, and it it concerned me that uh, my job, while I knew was going to be one of um, holding people accountable and ensuring that the city was being transparent, it kind of set me on edge that um, I was going to have to be really, really paying attention um, to what was going on behind the scenes. Right. Okay. Very well. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I'll defer to Dan if Dan has any questions. Okay. Um, are you, uh, given that history and everything, are you, are you uh, publicly supporting either of the candidates for, for mayor this year? You know, Dan, I, what I've tended to do, and we had an election in the city in 2020, my feeling always is I think it's inappropriate to come out and support because whomever is elected, I need to work with. Um, you know, even with Mayor Stoner, we had some serious bumps those first couple of years. I was concerned a lot about a lot of things. I think I've learned to work a little differently. And, you know, ultimately the goal is that we need to move the city forward. So I'm not supporting either candidate. Okay. Um, in your questionnaire, you said, uh, we asked about the Broward ethical campaign practice, whether you signed yeah. the pledge. And you said you weren't aware of it until it been brought up recently. But you, you also said uh, uh, that ethics and integrity are two of the reasons I ran for office in 2018, mm -hmm. yet I continue to see candidates and current elected continue to violate the public's trust. What do you mean by that? Well, I think I just gave you a good example when Steve asked me about the car allowance. I think that um, we we have an officer of the inspector general in place, and it's not for me as an elected official to determine if something is um, illegal or um, an ethics violation. I think that we have that organization, and I think that they do their due diligence, but they don't have enough teeth and something can be sent to the state attorney's office, and we've seen it in many municipalities um, where really nothing happens um, to that elected official. We've seen that, and I don't want to name cities, but they've been in your newspaper. So um, that is my concern. And, and as I said, that was recently brought up to me. I reached out to our city clerk, um, and she said it was there, but I, I never saw it. And I don't, I, I'm not aware if any of the candidates in any of our races had filled it out, but I certainly would have no problem with signing the pledge. I wish okay. it was made more public. Okay. Um, That's uh, let me just uh, let me just piggyback on that. That's a good question, and I, I'm going to check into something. In other communities that are having municipal elections, and one of the reasons we put that question on the survey is because it is routine in other cities for the city clerk to provide that campaign pledge to all candidates, and they're not required to sign it. But it raises a, a question in my mind that the city clerk and plantation wouldn't even make it available to the candidates. 
Well, and in all fairness, and let me let me say, we have a, a new city clerk who is doing a phenomenal job. She's new to the state. This is her first election. Um, she said to me that it was in our packet. I did not see it. Typically, whatever's in our packet is also on the website. Um, so many of us downloaded the information from the website instead of filling out the actual physical packet. So, um, you know, I want I want to make sure that I'm not throwing her under the bus, but I, I was not aware of that. Is the city clerk... Again, your charter and your strong mayor system, is the city clerk an employee or does the city clerk report to the mayor? She does. Um, you know, typically, I mean, the mayor has uh, in our charter, in the new charter, uh, if the mayor were to terminate the city clerk, she would have to get the city council's um, approval. I know most they say the city clerk works for the council. Um, what I have found with the strong mayor, former government, um, that everyone has been put on notice that because we are an at-will state uh, that they work for the mayor. Right. Explain something to to us and also to anyone viewing this. Explain in practicality how it works. Uh, can can the city council, by an extraordinary vote, uh, override an action by the mayor? Does the mayor have veto power over council decisions? What's the what's the tension there that's built into the system? So um, we cannot override the mayor. Um, you know, we, obviously, we are legislative, um, a legislative body. Our, our largest task is approving the budget. Uh, the mayor, and, and this was something that we talked about with this charter going forward, some of my colleagues wanted to remove the mayor's veto power um, so that the mayor would not be under sunshine law and would be able to communicate with the council. Um, I saw some merit in that, but I was a proponent of keeping sunshine in place because I could foresee, and again, we're talking about not necessarily our situation, but even in the future, that you might have a mayor who would pick and choose which council members they would communicate with. And I think that puts everybody at disservice. I thought it was better for the public to be able to have those discussions out in, um, in, in the sunshine. Um, so, you know, basically it's um, an inordinate amount of power. However, the council, if they are united, and I, I'll give you a, a brief example, Steve. Several years ago, and I believe it was 2020, as we were still on Zoom, um, at that budget um, hearing, I was very concerned that the employees were only given a 2.3% raise. I was fighting for 3%. Um, that was the mayor's budget that was coming to us. There were certain things in that budget that I thought were um, excessive, and, and plantation's always been very streamlined, but I thought there were a couple items that were excessive. Um, with the vote, with the consensus of the council, we were able to get those items um, uh, approved the way we wanted them to, and the mayor had to concur because we had a consensus. So I hope that answered your question. It does. Um, is, is the mayor... Is the mayor of Plantation a voting member of the city council? Only if there is a tie. If we we were for a while, we had a, a council member who passed away. So my first two years, we were uh, four council members. So the mayor could break a two-two tie. Okay. There. How many council members are there? Five. Five. Okay. Okay. I understand. Okay. Yep. Yeah. This is this is really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, the Sun Sentinel. For many, many years, way predating my service at the paper, the Sun Sentinel has been a proponent of an elected mayor at the county level. Mm -hmm. um, we think that there's a lack of accountability in the way the county makes decisions. You know, this is this is a city of plantation discussion, but but it's the, we're talking about the same structural type of government. Mm -hmm. And and you're right. I think you're absolutely right that there is no perfect system. Uh, God, you had a terrible situation with the city manager in the city of Tamarack. Correct. Um, you've got the city, one of the council members in Cooper City is at the city manager's throat on a, almost a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, uh, You're right. There's no, there's no perfect system. Right. Um, do you have any particular priority in a second term that um, you, you mentioned th th at the outset, the issues we talked about, but... but my, my priority, right, is really the strategic strategic planning because I think that encompasses a lot 
Um, one of my concerns is affordab affordability of housing. Um, you, we have a lot of residents who have recently been engaged, which has been a wonderful thing because we've had a development project that was of concern to them. Um, they're really paying attention now, um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, but it, I think it's important for the council and the mayor to be able to um, provide information that's easily digestible that uh, development has to be smart, but we also need to make sure that there's affordability, if I may. There is a project that I did not vote for. Um, it was of great concern to me in 2019. It was a trouble project. Uh, the council, I voted no on it. The council approved it. It was supposed to be condominiums. It is coming before us again because now they want to turn that into apartments. Now, my feeling is, and I've been met with Ralph Stone at the Housing Finance Authority last week, and I'm going to meet with the applicant. I'd love to take that opportunity because the units have already been approved, 330 of them, and put an affordable component in, into that. We need to start to look at financing and grants and what we have in place now um, to be able to provide affordability for people. I was just helping a 30-year educator, she's got her master's degree in education, right before school started, she was gonna be evicted because of the rise, you know, the, uh, the rise in her rent. So um, housing affordability and seeking those solutions um, is a priority and um, that's something okay. that I probably will be able to work on. Tell us tell us that particular project you just referred to, the project that, that where the developer wanted to turn condos into apartments. What, what are you speaking of there? Uh, it's a development on Sunrise and 441 uh, called Pixel. Um, that vote was, I believe, in April of 2019. I've had a lot of concerns about that project for the last several years. Um, but I, I think it's an opportunity now, and I want to be careful because if this is put out there because of sunshine, I believe it's coming back to us in October. Um, but as I said, I did meet with Ralph Stone from the um, Housing Authority last week because I wanted to see what type of grants were out there. Uh, you know, Nan Rich, Commissioner Nan Rich has been a great uh, proponent of affordability. Um, I had reached out to her. She said, you have to talk to Ralph Stone. Um, and there is some funding available and there are some tax incentives that the city, because that's in our CRA, that project, can partner with the applicant um, to be able to make those units more affordable, not just for the people, but for the developer. So I'm gonna be meeting with the applicant's attorney next week and okay. lay it out there um, and see what we can do. What's, what's the project you made, made reference to that, that got a lot of residents engaged and got them uh, mobilized? Plantation Acres, you may have seen the billboards on 595. So there was a proposed um, project um, by a very respected developer where he was looking to put um, primarily in the acres, not every home is on an acre, but that is our more rural community. A lot of people have horses and cows, um, especially in the middle acres where this project was going to be. And he wanted to put uh, three homes to an acre. So the, the, the neighborhood really activated. Um, many of them still come to our meetings. The project was uh, shelved temporarily. I don't know when they'll be coming back. Um, but the positive to that has been we've been able to have really more nuanced conversations with the residents about flexibility units, what that means, where we are in development, um, and, and how do we continue to preserve what makes plantation special but also make sure that it's still affordable so that the people who work in the city, especially in the service industry, can afford to live here. Let me ask you about one other project because it's come up in a couple of other, other conversations and that is the proposed redevelopment of the, the so-called AT&T building. This is the 8600 block of West Sunrise Boulevard, right? It's in the northern part of the city. Uh, it's a, it's a, a building that's been, been there for a long, long time. Uh, Am I right? The city rejected uh, the developer's initial proposal there, right? The city did not. The council did. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I meant that. I meant that. And, that's, and that's important. So uh, that was a project that um, I can be honest with you, I didn't like from the start. They were pushing it as mixed use. It really was not true mixed use. Um, the developer did come back and work with staff. Um, extensively and and made some concessions to that um, but uh, ultimately they did not even get the opportunity to present the project at council that night because we had denied the um, the, the land use uh, variances that they were um, they were looking for so I'm not sure what's going to happen that project what I will tell you Steve 
um, if I may. Um, this council, the five of us since 2020, are we may disagree on issues, but we're working more in concert with one another, and um, I, we're having great discussions uh, and really engaging the public in our decision making. And we push back on a couple of projects. We've reduced the density on a few, and we push back. So I think if I'm not mistaken, in the last four years, um, there's only been um, a little over 300 multifamily approved. We've approved some single family, but it's less than 700 units in the city. Um, where previous councils, it was up to 4,000 units. And I think that's an important distinction. Okay, is, is there, uh, I hate to use sort of bumper sticker language, but is there on the city council, is there a, is there a slow growth or a pro-growth faction? Is there a philosophical clash at times over the pace and density of development that should be allowed? I think for the council, um, I don't want to speak for my count for my colleagues, but I think for the council as a body, um, as as I said, there's been pushback on some of the applications. Um, I think that my feeling with the council is we need to slow this down. Okay. Yep. And. Which part of the community uh, did you were you making reference to you at least to what I heard you say was with a part of the city of plantation there's been a slow maybe deterioration degradation in aesthetics and sure and I and I hate to say degradation I just think as we're seventy years mm -hmm. old you're going to see certain neighborhoods that are starting to show their wear certain streets I would say along uh, Eastern Broward Boulevard you know the eastern part of the city. Uh, that we need to really take a look at it. You know, it's like in your home. Sometimes you walk by everything, something every day, and you don't you don't see it any longer. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I had wanted to do when I when I first ran is talked about getting a neighborhood group of of you know builders, people in the construction trade, painters that would want to go in. And I used the example of my mom is a widow go into somebody who maybe is living on social security, can't afford to fix her fence or paint her house. Um, the mayor had a similar idea, had implemented, um, I knew there was a contract drawn with the city attorney, it was gonna be a, kind of like a neighbors, you know, helping neighbors. There was one event that we had gone out, I know council member An uh, Anderson and the mayor and I had gone out and we had painted and planted um, uh, landscaping in three homes uh, in our Park East neighborhood, but then nothing else materialized. So you asked me about my priorities. That's something that I really want to make sure that we can implement. I've spoken to our interfaith community. They're looking for a project, and I think if it's community-based, and it could be small projects, but I think there's a lot of people, we need to make sure they're maintaining their, um, uh, you know, their, their um, value in their homes, uh, and I think that we could be in a position to help them as a community. Oh, very good. Interesting. Is it was was the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, a, a a direct factor in what is basically it's what looks to be to the I think to the average resident's eye, the, the 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 redevelopment of the Broward Mall site is stagnated. Uh, it's, at least it seems to have. And was was COVID part of the reason for that? To my knowledge, um, I don't think that was the main factor. Um, uh, I come, my husband was a retail executive. I come from a retail background. I think we've seen before COVID, uh, regional malls are changing. A lot of people are doing, uh, their shopping online. So I think that there were some challenges there. We had approved several restaurants that were going into that. And my understanding and talking to the planning department, some of those restaurants were starting to pull out before COVID hit. Um, and obviously, Seritage, who owns that now empty shell of a building, um, was troubled. They ended up with financial trouble. I don't think, Steve, that it was solely due to COVID. But I do believe that we now have an opportunity. Most people don't realize that mall had five owners. And it was very hard for the city to ever, ever, ever bring everyone to the table to decide what they wanted to see with that property. So I think we have the opportunity now with some of those anchors um, you know, and, and certainly with the mall and receivership to be able to hopefully implement some type of master plan because it's right in the middle of our city. And um, I think that with that amount of space, we could really do something great there. Yeah. I mean, that was I'm going back way back in time, but that place was a major gathering place for the whole community. It really was. It was. And I'd like yeah. to see that again. Okay. 
All right. Well, uh, we could cover a lot more ground, but I uh, uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken this morning with us. Uh, you obviously value, um, you know, our readers who are also your constituents, and we really appreciate that very much. So, uh, Thank you. thanks, Denise. Thanks for being with us this morning. Good luck Thank to you. you. Thank you both yes. for the opportunity. Enjoy your yeah. day. Okay, great. See you later. Bye.